Thanks a lot, Shujita. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for making time on a Tuesday morning for joining us. We have the budget also being announced today. So we're going to keep the session tight um, so that by the time the finance minister starts her speech, uh, you will be free to monitor the new announcements which are coming in. Uh, this particular report uh, is a debrief uh, of, of the larger uh, report that we end up publishing with NASCOM every year. Uh, we end up doing this India Startup Landscape Report uh, with NASCOM. It was recently released on 21st of January uh, by Minister Piyush Goyal um, and the NASCOM team. Uh, it's a 100-page report. It's available on the NASCOM website. Should any of you be interested, you can write into us also. Now, before we get started, uh, it's very important to understand the, the first principles from the report perspective. We have a very specific definition of the word startup that is used in terms of building the report. Startup is a company which is A, less than 10 years old. Number two, it's of Indian origin, which means it's either headquartered in India or the core product development happens in India. Uh, that is to say about 70% of the workforce is ex-India. The third point, there is an important differentiation in terms of innovation. It could be technology, business process, or business model, but it has to be something unique. And lastly, it's a company which is not an idea stage firm. It's a prototype, a plus plus kind of a firm. That is to say, it has at least some customer traction before we even consider it to be part of the report itself. Now, important call out here is that we look at only technology startups, which is to say technology is a very critical factor in terms of companies' existence and operations. It is central to the product, which means that we would not be including a D2C brand in the report itself. Uh, but we would be including an e-commerce platform or e-commerce enabler tool, which could be used by a D2C brand from a business perspective. Now, that being said, as a quick uh, snapshot of the ecosystem, we have about 25,000 to 26,000 startups active in the ecosystem today. Uh, roughly 10% of this base was added in the calendar year 2021. And overall, the ecosystem has been growing at about 39% CAGR in the last 10 years. These are significant numbers in terms of the growth rate that we have been seeing. And this also contributes to India being the third largest ecosystem in the world. Um, lesser known fact about us is that about 40% of the companies are B2B. Um, the reason it's 40% is, is that in the first five years, that is 2011 to 16 period, the majority of the firms were B2C. And in the later years, we have been seeing more of B2B. Overall, because of the number distribution, it comes to about 40% today. Um, it was a fantastic year in terms of 2021. The ecosystem is today valued at about $300 billion plus in terms of private market valuation, about 2x growth compared to the year 2020. We have about 42 unicorns which are added in the last year, and we had 750 plus unique institutional investors participating um, in, in these rounds. Now, when we say institutional investors, what we mean here is venture capitalists, private equity, and corporates. Uh, any institutional body uh, is counted into this particular bracket. Uh, it was also a record year for us in terms of funding. We saw about $24.1 billion of investment coming in the calendar year, which is there. And in that particular piece, it was a significant jump from 2019, which was a pre-COVID high for us. And of course, compared to 2020, um, in terms of overall funding numbers, which are there. You would notice that there has been a huge jump in late stage funding. Uh, this is on account of two reasons. One is, uh, A, we had a lot more unicorn editions and typical unicorn editions happen with mega rounds. These are $100 million plus single round investments into the company. But that being said, we also saw a lot more increase in 20 million, 50 million, uh, 70 million kind of rounds happening into the ecosystem. It's a great sign. It's, it's a sign of investors being confident in, in, in the potential of these startups and what they can really achieve. It's also one reason why you don't see a significant jump in terms of number of deals as compared to the number of, uh, you know, the dollar investment, which is there. Now, while these figures are great, I think the real story lies in the fact that we have also seen a good growth in early stage financing and also in terms of seed stage financing. Seed stage is almost two eggs of, again, its pre-COVID high. Why is this important? Uh, this is really important is because seed stage investments are an early indicator of how is the ecosystem really doing well? Is the money only going to few companies or is it getting distributed to a larger set of people? Uh, innovation is all about probability. So you need to sort of also focus on top of the funnel and not just the bottom of the funnel. And in that sense, this was a spectacular year for us. 
Uh, seed stage funding is something we have been calling out regularly in the last months in our reports as a focus area, uh, not just for the investors, but even for the policy makers to enable uh, more participation into the ecosystem, which is there. Uh, if we go a bit more further, uh, what we end up noticing is that um, this uh, growth in seed stage funding is also accompanied by a couple of other factors, right? Uh, my favorite piece is the fact that 58% of all the startups that raised funding in 2021 we're doing it for the first time. Um, and this is of paramount importance again, it is because it shows that we have more entrepreneurs participating, the quality of the products they are building out is significantly higher. And of course, investors are willing to bet a lot more early uh, on these particular companies. This is again represented not just in terms of percentage share of number of startups funded, but also significant increase in the total dollars that they end up collecting from the investors. And furthermore, if we double click more, we will notice that about 34% of these companies are less than two years old. Um, this jump from 22% to 34% in terms of companies less than two years old and raising the funding is again interesting is because India has traditionally uh, been a tougher market for entrepreneurs. Uh, we have been conservative investors. So we have been asking for a lot more traction, a lot more metrics uh, before investing in a company, which many a times meant that our entrepreneurs they're on a back foot in terms of building something new compared to their global peers. Uh, it's a good trend, it's a positive trend. Um, it's not to say that all these companies will succeed, but this aspect of willing to bet early is definitely a great um, of, of great significance for the ecosystem. Um, apart from these numbers, I think the other piece which really stood out for us is the fact that we had about 750 unique institutional investors participating in the year. It's a significant jump from the year 2020 and even 2019. But furthermore, what's really interesting is the distribution spread, which is there, right? If you look at this graph very closely, what you would notice is that you have funding rounds at the bottom on the x-axis, and in the y-axis, you have number of unique institutional investors participating, and this growth is across the board. Um, when, when we look at the ecosystem, it's very important not to see only a lopsided growth, either in seed or in late stage. Uh, or in you know early stage for that matter, it's very important for the ecosystem health for each of these stages to really grow. Uh, it's a clear sign of how your funnel is really coming along, right? Um, how many new entrepreneurs are getting added? Who's supporting them? What are the odds of them succeeding over a period of time? Should they be able to meet their metrics? And in that sense, um, this is definitely encouraging for us as an ecosystem. Uh, we of course saw increase in mega deals. And that was a big contributor in terms of new investors coming in. Uh, and these are just a few examples, right? Baiju's raising a, a, a billion dollars, Swiggy raising $800 million. They recently announced $700 million funding round, which is there. And this is again, you know, very, very encouraging for us is because what it tells is that the investors are not just betting on the product, but they're also betting on India as a market. Uh, and this is an evolving, growing market, which should work in our favor as we go along. Uh, when we speak of the market, uh, it's also the big story in terms of why India added third largest number of unicorns in a single calendar year. We were beaten only by US and China. Israel, which is a great innovation ecosystem, added a lower number of unicorns than India. Uh, a key reason here is, is the India market aspect. And of course, since we have a great talent base, uh, a growing market, since we have the optionality of not just selling locally, but also selling globally. Our perspective is that we will continue to see a definite growth in terms of number of companies, well-known companies globally, uh, leading companies uh, you know, from India. Uh, I think the month of January has already saw, seen four to five unicorns being added. Uh, fingers crossed, if, if, if this trend goes on, we'll definitely see ourselves jumping and leading the rest of the world. Um, in terms of unicorns itself, um, while we do speak about 42, I think it becomes even more interesting when we realize that 60% of the 70 unicorns active today were founded only in the last year, in 2021. Uh, when we started the year, we had about 39 unicorns. We added about 42 firms into the unicorn club. About 11 of them ended up exiting or losing the unicorn status is because they went for their IPOs. A unicorn is only considered uh, as a company which is private and has a billion dollar valuation. So as soon as they went public, they sort of lost the unicorn status. Um, but that being said, again, you know, if you look at the numbers very closely, 16% of all the active unicorns are less than three years old. 
13% of these unicorns are valued more than $5 billion. Overall, great numbers, uh, which is there. Um, definitely puts a pressure on the entrepreneurs, uh, you know, given what's been happening with the global stock markets and the Sensex recently in terms of maintaining these valuation. But I would say it's still a good problem to have at hand. Um, the interesting part is this. Um, if you look at someone like a Falcon X um, or, or someone like a Zetworks or someone like Ola Electric or up now, what we saw was a nicer distribution in terms of uh, companies uh, which got the unicorn status. Zetworks is solving the EPC problem. It's a real world engineering, production, manufacturing problem, which is that Falcon X is solving a lot on the crypto side a lot on the institutional banking side, APNA is solving the blue collar uh, job problem. So there's a good variety uh, of, of unicorns which came in. We also saw, you know, first time unicorns in multiple categories. I think we had healthcare, which saw three unicorns for the first time. Uh, we had real estate and construction in terms of infrared market or no broker coming up. There was of course, you know, APNA, which became uh, a unicorn in HR. We had Darwin Box in this month, which has come up. Uh, overall good distribution. I think we have active unicorns in close to about uh, 20 plus sectors in the country today. Apart from the unicorns, we also look at the potential unicorn pipeline. Uh, this again saw a significant jump. Uh, 58 out of 135 companies were achieved the status in the last year itself. Uh, to keep things simple, we describe a potential unicorn as a firm which has raised $50 million plus in cumulative funding. Uh, by then, they typically have uh, upwards of $400 million in terms of valuation and have a fairly decent chance of hitting the unicorn uh, mark uh, in the next two to three years. Um, now, while we look at the numbers, interesting piece for me was that, you know, we have about four sectors which have more than 10 plus potential unicorns. These include BFSI, supply chain logistics, retail, and real estate construction, which is there. So a lot of core industries, BFSI has had a great year, which is there. Now, compared to the distribution of overall startup ecosystem, compared to the composition of the unicorns, where about 63% are B2C, if you would look at the number here, it's about 43% are B2B. So our sense is that over the next few years, the percentage of B2B startups in the overall ecosystem, in the unicorns, in the potential unicorns, across the funnel lattice, will keep on going up you know, consistently. A very big reason of this is the focus on SaaS and on the enterprise tech in terms of building from India and going global. About 23% of companies are already servicing global markets today. Um, now, while you spoke about investments, uh, it's also important for the ecosystem to see exits. Uh, without these exits, the flywheel does not work because the entrepreneurs have not realized the wealth, which is on paper currently, neither have employees or the early investors. Uh, and once they do, it's easier for them to invest again and for them to keep growing, right? So returns is what all of us are looking for, end of the day. Um, in significant increase overall, again, uh, in terms of numbers, both from 2020 and 2019. Um, the more interesting part was that 66% of these, these were led by Indian or global start, by Indian startups. Um, and about the, the average age of you know, the firms here is again about five to seven years. But yet again, you know, 52% of uh, acquired targets were B2B companies. Very, very similar to global numbers, B2B firms typically get acquired a lot more faster compared to B2C for a variety of reasons. Typically it's because integrations are a lot more easier and uh, it's, uh, it's um, typically um, easier to sort of expand from a market perspective or expand from a new product, a portfolio perspective, which is there. Now, what you would see on the distribution side is that, you know, while the share of Indian and global startups has increased, uh, if you multiply the numbers very closely, the number of corporate deals have also increased, both from global and Indian corporates. And we'll touch upon this as we go along further into the presentation. Um, a very big reason for these deals to really increase is the fact that uh, in 2020, with COVID coming in, there was a huge shift to digital in terms of market adoption. And also in terms of companies having to respond very differently to these changes. So with higher market acceptance, a need to sort of go digital, uh, there has been a lot of push in terms of uh, building new capabilities or expanding the, the product portfolios. A typical concern here becomes the talent in terms of how quickly can you hire people and how quickly can you ramp them up. And we know what happened last year with the great resignation in terms of churn that all of us had to face and feed uh, as the year went along. And this was one very big contributor in terms of companies looking to acquire capabilities, not necessarily build them in-house. 
Uh, a very big reason was, you know, expanding the product portfolio or, you know, building the tech capabilities. Um, market expansion was important, but if you see a significant chunk is all about saying, I want access to great talent and great products, which will help me accelerate my strategic goals a lot more faster um, than what, you know, would be possible if I go solo. Um, this, we believe, is going to be a very important trend in the next few years. Um, <clears throat> the whole build by partner model from our conversations is being revisited by a lot of CXOs, and they're trying to figure it out that what does that look like in the in the new age? Uh, do companies need to change how they decide what to build in-house versus what to procure, what to you know partner for? Uh, and this is an evolution journey today. Uh, we will see things evolving. Uh, it will be in a state of flux for that matter. Uh, in next three, three to four years, but overall, we will definitely see a lot more acquisitions happening, which is there. Um, an important call out for a lot of GCOEs actually hiring is again being of you know great interest to startups and corporates in the last year. Uh, this is one segment we do expect a lot more traction from the GCOE perspective uh, of expanding the talent pools which are there. Um, what we are hearing right now is that global headquarters are a lot more comfortable in terms of looking at these uh, talent acquisition pieces or product acquisition pieces compared to what they were in 2020, 2019 or prior to that. Um, apart from m and it was a great year in IPOs, maybe not the best time for me to talk about IPOs given what's happened with Sensex and the Paytm crash. Um, interestingly, just as a caller, if you look at tech stocks across the world, uh, they tend to fall in the first six months um, of, of their listing, uh, multiple reasons for it. I think a good example is Dropbox, which uh, in its private market valuation was at $10 billion. Today it has significantly higher amount of revenues, but the market cap is still about $10 billion. Um, I think that's just how the private markets work. Uh, but that being said, a very good year in terms of exits. A lot of capital came back to investors, founders, you know, had the money come in, but we had to close, we had a lot more millionaires getting created in terms of employees. Um, and them now going out and becoming angel investors or them supporting new startups coming in. So from a flywheel perspective, this was definitely, definitely a great year for us. Um, the other common piece comes to us is this, is saying that, hey, look, you know, is the startup ecosystem only about Bangalore? Is it only about Delhi? There was a news article today uh, which said that Delhi is the tech startup ecosystem of, of uh, tech uh, startup uh, startup capital of India. Um, a lot of debate on that particular topic. Uh, but suffice to say that, you know, we have a, a, a bigger story, which is beyond Bangalore, Delhi, or Bombay, or Chennai, or Hyderabad, for that matter. Roughly about 29% of, of the firms today are coming in from what we call as emerging startup hubs. These are cities like Ahmedabad, Kolkata, Coimbatore, Kochi, um, uh, Surat, Indore. Um, and they have a decent distribution of firms coming in. The interesting bit is this, is that if you look at year by year data, then we notice that in the calendar year 2021, with about 2,300 companies being founded, 40% of them came from emerging hubs. If you go back into, into time, in 2015, only 25% of the startups then were from emerging hubs. So we're definitely seeing a good shift in terms of people moving out of the bigger cities and building startups in their local territories. Multitude of reasons, uh, predominantly because of better government policies, uh, stronger local ecosystems, shift in terms of the problem statements they are solving. Uh, a lot of them are focusing on what we call as India-specific problems. There's also a good shift in terms of realizing that you can build global products you know, from anywhere in India. You don't necessarily need to be in Bangalore when you're starting your journey. And then there are, of course, those advantages of cost. Um, the fact that you can stay closer to your families or uh, just a simple piece that the cost of living in these cities is much more lower. So we're going to expect this shift to continue uh, for the next couple of years. Our sense is that this would st stabilize somewhere in the 60-40 range, 60% established and about 40% emerging uh, in terms of times to come. Um, from a deep tech perspective, about 12% of the companies are leveraging deep tech. Um, uh, from in terms of building their solutions. The most popular one uh, happens to be AI and ML. Um, quite evident at that because even if you're building a connected solution, you want to make it smart. So you might have an IoT solution, but you would want to put AI on top of it. Um, you have a big data problem, you want to make it smart, you automatically shift towards AI. So there's a natural advantage in terms of us wanting to move towards smarter solutions why AI picks up. Uh, but that being said, again, you know, we are seeing a very significant growth in terms of blockchain or in terms of 
AR, VR, the whole metaverse conversation is really, really strong in the ecosystem today. And similarly with 3D printing and drones. Um, what's really encouraging is, is to you know, know of stories where people don't realize these are Indian startups. A great example is Polygon. Um, uh, it has a token called Asmatic. For those of you who are active in crypto, uh, you would know Matic had, had been growing really well. Um, like a lot of cryptocurrencies in past, uh, it's been one of the stabler ones in terms of uh, post corrections and pricing. But this is a solution built by Indian engineers, which most of the world believes is the American solution. Uh, it's a very classical story. Uh, there are about 7,000 plus applications built on top of it. Some of them, you know, going into NFTs and gaming tokens, which are getting more and more popular. Uh, but suffice to say, the product is seeing a lot of adoption, right? And it's built by Indians from India, still, you know, seen by the world as an American product. And we have a lot of such stories in terms of Skit or Observe.ki. Um, this is an ecosystem which, which is still relatively nascent compared to the larger Indian startup ecosystem. Uh, our sense is that the deep tech, uh, you know, is where we as India were in 2015. Um, we have a lot of good stories. Uh, now we have to focus on volumes. And there are some of these initiatives that NASCOM is working on. There are a lot of corporate programs which are active, which are supporting deep tech startups. Uh, over the course of the next two to three years, um, uh, we are pretty optimistic that the gap between perception in terms of how Israel is seen and how India is seen will start to reduce. Uh, it will take about two to three years at the very least, maybe three to five years. But we are definitely on that journey where uh, Indian entrepreneurs from an innovation, from a tech complexity perspective, will be considered at par as an ecosystem in Israel or value for that matter. Now, a very quick sector view. What we did was we tried to figure out which sectors are really growing. So uh, on the y-axis, we looked at the percentage share of a sector as, uh, uh, as part of the whole ecosystem. And then we looked at what was the five-year CAGR for each of these particular sectors from a growth rate perspective. Now, the top five sectors constitute about 51% of the ecosystem, which is edtech, enterprise, healthcare, BFSI, retail tech. A common question we get is that, hey, why don't you, you know, consider SaaS? Uh, the reason we don't look at SaaS separately is because it's a business model, it's not an industry. Uh, and in that sense, you will have SaaS solutions across this, this whole chart, uh, which is there. Um, uh, now, that being said, there are these stories you would see happening very often. For example, gaming. Uh, you know of NPL, you know of uh, Nazara, which has been doing fairly well. That's a listed form now. Uh, or in terms of fitness and wellness, uh, I think the most popular brand for us has been CureFit. Uh, but there are a lot more which are coming up. Uh, there's something called the Ultra Human, which is uh, being raved uh, as a product, not just in India, but also in US for its, its efficiency. And similarly, you know, social platforms like Koo, uh, which are solving for the Indian segment. Uh, overall, you know, extremely good growth, growth rates across the ecosystem, across industries. Uh, these are typical choices that every ecosystem goes for because uh, this is where most of the founders have a lot of relativity in terms of problems and they have a natural bias to it. Um, our perspective is that over the course of next four to five years, mobility, agri-tech, automotive, industrial manufacturing will start to pick up a lot more. A key reason for this is the market acceptance levels will be much more higher. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, in industrial manufacturing, uh, a very big base is MSME. Uh, they have their own concerns in terms of adopting technology. At the time that base is not ready, you can't really do much, but the base itself is shifting. It's getting more digitized. It's open to newer solutions, and that's what's really going to support the ecosystem as we go along. Um, from a funding perspective in the sector view, uh, this is a quick snapshot. BFSI had a great year, about 25% of investments last year. Uh, education, retail, food tech were the other ones which were there. Um, the outlier here is, of course, food tech, because while it had about 8% of the total funding, Majority of it went to Zomato and Swiggy and few others. Um, uh, as an ecosystem, you know, food tech is pretty small, and that's one reason. Uh, what you would see here is is that you know it's one of the smaller uh, percentages of the whole startup base, um, you know, in the ecosystem today. Um, while we look at these numbers, it's also important to look at which sectors saw the highest increase, which sectors saw highest investments in seed stage and early stage. And you'll tend to start noticing a slight difference in terms of the combination. Uh, overall, we think that financial inclusion, financial solutions will always be fairly big in a country like India. So it would be something like education uh, and enterprise tech. Uh, education, BFS has a lot to do with the India market and the India opportunity. 
enterprise has a lot to do with India plus global opportunity. So we'll keep seeing these elements come in. And as we go along, we'll, we'll of course, you know, see a focus shifting towards agri and supply chain logistics. So it's it's been a good year across the sectors, a lot of sub stories. I won't get into details right now, uh, but we have tried to cover a lot of these elements in the main report itself. Now, coming to the real uh, crux of the matter, um, what does this mean, you know, from a corporate perspective? Um, I'm, of course, biased here because I would want all of you to be engaging with startups a lot more, um, A, because it's my job to sort of help you. Uh, but that being said, I think there's a lot of merit in terms of uh, re-looking at how we think about uh, um, increasing our market share, right? Or how we think about increasing our margins. Um, we need to rethink the build by partner models um, from, from execution perspective. And uh, the merit is in, 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 in thinking is because of the data, right? We have a 260 plus unique corporates who participated in 2021. It's almost 1.5x of 2020. We are seeing a significant jump in investments. We are seeing increase in M&A. And there is a lot of growth in open innovation programs. And what you would notice here is that a lot of firms are using a combination approach, right? Someone like, say, Microsoft, Google, Airtel, uh, the Tata Group, uh, Reliance Group, uh, all of them are using a combination of these, these structures. They're investing in firms. They're acquiring majority or minority stakes in the company or they are launching their own collaboration programs. Nobody's using only one way. They are using a combination approach to figure out how to grow. Um, from a GCP perspective, I think the feather in the cap is that 62% of these open innovation programs are led by GCOEs. They are a very big contributor to the ecosystem. And we anticipate this number to stay strong for the coming years also, as more and more firms, uh, their headquarters are asking them to tap into the Indian startup ecosystem or the Indian innovation ecosystem overall. Um, from an M&A perspective uh, and investment perspective, a few more details. Uh, in terms of investments, we, of course, saw a growth. Uh, what I found really interesting was the growth in seed stage investments. Um, this is uh, a, a, a big call out is because corporates have typically preferred to come in at early stage or late stage. Early stage is typically series A plus. Late stage is the mega rounds that we talk about or series C, series D, which is there much later in the company's journey. Uh, but this growth in seed stage was really interesting for us to notice. Um, it, it almost talks about the fact that there's a lot of acceptance at headquarters uh, for, for the teams to bet a lot more early into the Indian startup ecosystem. Uh, a good mix of firms across the board. We have someone like Unilever and the Times of India participating. Um, PSUs have been pretty active in terms of investments also. Um, and then, of course, there is the, the popular ones that's like SoftBank Group or, the Google, or Google and Microsoft out there. 17% um, of all the rounds had at least one corporate investor. Uh, it's again, you know, extremely big number. Uh, out of all the corporates which participated, 52% were global MNCs, about 48% were uh, Indian MNCs. Again, a very good mix in terms of uh, data points to talk about, uh, the possibilities or the opportunities or how the world is looking at Indian startups. Uh, from an M&A perspective, um, uh, the participation from Indian MNCs has been rather consistent. Uh, during the uh, the pandemic period, uh, the first wave, that is, uh, there was a drop in terms of cross-border deals, uh, extremely uh, understandable. Uh, it was not easy for firms to figure out how to do deals, not only uh, cross-border, but in a construct where you could not really go and meet uh, these founders or their investors, or you had to rethink your due diligence approaches. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, what is a shift, not just in India, but globally in terms of cross-border deals. We saw the same thing happening. In the year 2021, this, this group has really returned in terms of their participation. Um, and overall, uh, the company still prefer, the corporate still prefer to acquire firms which are slightly older. Uh, we look at the data and we say that, okay, majority of these firms are more than five years old in terms of their age when they're getting acquired. Uh, at this stage, typically you end up going for a company because a, either it has a great market penetration that makes sense for you to pick up, or it has a great product which has been validated and you can scale it, or a combination of both of them. So it's a lot to do in terms of the quality of the asset, uh, which, which becomes the critical factor. Um, in terms of open innovation pieces, um, we of course have seen a good growth. Uh, important part here for us, again, is that this is across the sectors, which is there. So about 20 plus industries have at least one active program in terms of collaborating with startups. 
uh, it's growing at about you know twenty percent over the last four year period. Um, what I find rather important for us to note is that the market that these programs are serving for are global, right? So we have companies solving for India market, we have companies solving for North American market, we have companies solving for Latin market as well, and there's of course a play on Europe uh, which ends up coming in. So good distribution, uh, the broader strategy being that we want to work with best startups in the world. If India's third largest, then why don't we tap into it? And how do we be creative? Um, and from a G Suite construct, uh, there are a few interesting pieces to think about. Uh, if let's take retail for example, also you cannot do so much so in terms of adding a new brand into the company's portfolio, but you can do a lot more when you're thinking about digital transformation. Not just digital transformation, you can even have a lot of influence on sustainability goals by reducing the amount of fuel required for you to operate, say from deliveries perspective or from inbound logistics perspective. You can even drive a lot of these sustainability goals for the firm selling out of India. The other advantage is that this narrative is no longer about building from India, only working with the Indian startup ecosystem. Uh, a great example here is someone like Falabella. Uh, they are LATAM retail majors. They have a very powerful GCO here in India. Uh, and what the scheme does is it works with startups across the world. They work with North American companies. They work with European companies. They, of course, work with Indian companies all with the intent of solving for the LATAM market. So uh, the, the whole COVID element, which helped a lot of these firms, um, you know, expand their programs or build new innovation programs, was the fact that location does not matter in most scenarios where the GCO is really involved. Um, as a last point from our side, uh, there's always this debate of saying that, do we really need to look at open innovation programs? Do we really need to look at investments and acquisitions as a growth strategy? Um, what if other peers are doing, maybe I don't want to do it. Um, and this is where we wanted to point out one very important aspect for you. Whatever we talk about from growth and innovation perspective with corporates, today we are seeing unicorns and potential unicorns deploying those tactics. They're learning from the corporates and they're executing a lot more faster in terms of how they are growing. They themselves are changing their playbook. And if nothing else, this is something I would definitely encourage all of you to dig a lot more deeper when you look at the report. About 24% of Indian unicorns and potential unicorns are actively investing in startups, they're acquiring companies, or they're running their own structured innovation program. Uh, these numbers are going up and they will continue to go up, but it's a very good reflection of the ecosystem. As a last piece for us, uh, we do anticipate 2022 uh, to be another great year. There will be a good momentum in terms of investment. Uh, we will continue to see more IPOs coming into the ecosystem. There are already uh, a bunch of IPOs that have been filed for and more filings expected as we go along. Uh, m as are expected to continue to stay strong as companies figure out how to grow. A unicorn pool uh, by virtue of these events will continue to expand. And of course, you know, our favorite bit is that we'll see more sectors become prominent. We'll see sectors, you know, listing their first unicorn, uh, their first potential unicorns and growing along the way. Uh, areas like Aditai gaming, um, you know, blockchain, Web3, automotive, industrial manufacturing, and some of the spaces we believe will, will become a lot more prominent as we go along.